tonight, live from Virginia Beach, Virginia, podcasting all things musical from Southeast Virginia. Our sound, our songs, our artists, and our business. Welcome to SivaCast with host Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Let's get talking. Good evening, everybody. This is Tom Farley, and I am in the presence of some of the best classic rock music in the area of Southeast Virginia. Uh, I have Lee Brown, John Houlihan, and Ron Thornburg with me. Faithful Kate Band, uh, actually Faithful Kate, uh, one of the best classic rock bands in Southeast Virginia. And we're going to do a SIVA cast for you, give you a little background as to where these guys are coming from, and also give you a a little taste of some of their music along the way. So how's it going, guys? Doing How great, doing, Tom. Tom. Doing very well. Thank you. Well, listen, uh, one of the things I'm the most interested in is uh, the evolution of, you know, brothers uh, into Faithful Kate. Uh, I mean, I, I love the brothers thing, but I also I haven't heard the Faithful Kate music yet, but uh, I've talked to Lee about it. And, of course, he's he's totally excited. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you guys went from from one situation into another? Yeah, so that's a uh, it was a fun story. <clears throat> Actually, brothers came quite naturally to us because we've been together so long. Uh, John and I are related through a uh, marriage. John married my sis. And so uh, we are brothers in a sense. And uh, we made Ron an honorary brother about 28 years ago. And so uh, it's, it's, it feels good to us. You know, we feel like brothers. We, we know each other uh, on stage at least we didn't really have to wonder what each other were doing. And, uh, you know, so that was kind of how we took the, the moniker of brothers to start the project. Um, as we worked through the, the project and got closer to the finish, it seemed to us that uh, we needed something a little more distinctive, something that maybe represented us uh, as a group more than the brothers name although it's a cool name there are a lot of brothers bands out there (laughs) and uh it was getting a little it got it gets lost in the mix when you get out into uh the world of streaming music it was very hard to identify sometimes in five i understand yeah Uh, and but it's very dear to us that name was dear to us we we loved it every time we said it to each other and every time it it went out on the air uh faithful kate started as a song and uh, the song is is inspired by uh, the relationship between uh, a lady popularly known as Big Nose Kate in the mid to late 1900s. You may have heard of her. She oh sure, Doc her. Holliday's girlfriend. There it is, man. There yeah. it is. So the story was just so uh, dynamic. It was a wonderful uh, sounding tale, and. Uh, I couldn't help but dig into, uh, let's say, a scene from their life. And so that's how that song began. Uh, The the band fleshed the parts out, and um, John added uh, some lyrics, and we ended up with this fun little song called Faithful Kate, a little play on words. Uh, uh, But you know what? Faithful Kate is about this woman and uh, Catherine and her determination and tenacity during that really hard time in America kind of reminded us of what we've gone through as a band all these years. And so we felt honored to carry the name Faithful Kate.
First of all, what made you decide to actually uh, begin a an album project? Which, of course, is a is a major you know, that's a commitment. Uh, but you're already together. You're already having fun. You already have your sound. So, what made you decide at this point in time to actually record this new album? So, it started with a particular song, one that we had written uh, back in the '90s, as a uh, as the band Rocking Horse. That in the '90s, it was the same. It was just the three of us, a trio. And we did a lot of original music, and one of our most popular songs was a song called Step Long. We'd start with fixing that song. We thought we felt it needed a little bit of an upgrade. Uh, There were some things that lacked, but still we thought it was the best thing we'd written back at that time. So that, you know, I'll defer to Lee. That really got us into the studio. Like, let's fix the song and make it sound as good as it could. Are you talking about uh, just a uh, production like recording quality uh, uh, improvement or performance improvement? It was a little of both. We we did a little bit of we played with the song a little bit with the bridge and things like that. But we the flavor that you people that have known us for years know the song. They knew what we were doing. They they still recognize it. Uh, but to get it recorded in a really professional studio and get a good sound with it, and it went from there. And we just kept writing. Lee kept coming up with melodies and structures and tunes. And next thing you know, uh, you got to do something with them. You can't hold them in. And we were in a position where we felt we could we could get them down on tape slash whatever it's called now. And um, we agreed, the three of us agreed, the music's no good unless you share it. Absolutely. And if somebody gives you a, somebody says they like your song, that obviously it feeds your ego and you, you keep creating and you keep sharing. And we felt during the process, the creations were better, getting better and better. So we've just been really happy with this past year and a half. <laughs> Okay. 
And, and where do you guys do your recording when you record? So uh, we started out recording here in our home studio. We recorded one track in here, and that went really well, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and that kind of prompted us to move out and search for a studio that could handle the project quicker, more efficiently, with a higher quality, so that we could actually undertake a full album. And that uh, that choice was Master Sound Studios in Virginia Beach. Uh, owner engineer Robert Ulsh. I know Rob Ulsh. He's a he's he's a classic guy. He's been around for decades, man. He has oh. and, and produced some of the best music that has ever graced our ears. So what a wonderful experience that's been. I can't say enough about Rob. We love him. He's absolutely part of this band. And uh, <laughs> we, we had a lot of laughs, um, a lot of emotion in that studio. And, uh, and we came out with a product that we're satisfied with. So it's been a great, great time. So, so what is your all's process as far as like, you know, which tracks you all do first? And then uh, uh, do you... Uh, do you basically just put down some rough stuff and then work your vocals in? I mean, how do you actually do it? There are so many different ways that people have approached this. Sometimes uh, people get really wrapped around the axle because of time and money, but at the end of the day, you, you want to get it right. So you you have a process, and, it, and if it's worked for you before, then it'll work for you again. And, and Rob's the kind of person that can adapt and really work with a process. So, you know, what did you guys decide on doing? You're correct. Rob was, he's open to anything. But we looked at, we had to look at money. We were, we were being very practical in the beginning. We didn't know how long this would take. So we approached it from the sounds we loved, which was generally live recordings, um, say 1974 Aerosmith, where they're going to go in. They already know what they're going to play. And they're going to do a song in front of, you know, all five members are playing live. That's tough. So we went in with similarities. We would go with drums, bass, and a scratch guitar track and some scratch vocals. We'd get the rhythm section down um, and just spend our, you know, our time to get a song down that way. You guys went in and actually recorded this thing, everybody playing live. We started out that way. Yes. And it was a lot of fun. However, it's not very practical as, uh, as if you're, a, if you're a jazz band, that's logged in maybe 30 years of playing live, but we're not. And uh, so as John said, put down a scratch guitar and a bass, and then we let Ron uh, go in there and do his thing. So we laid the drums down first. And that's pretty standard stuff. And from there, John would lay his bass track down, and uh, I would redo my rhythm track and then uh, go over any solos. Sometimes we would have the keyboard come in first, though, just in case I wanted to work off the keyboard, you know, for a solo. And that was that's the basic tracks. I mean, we're it's a simple outline because we're we're basically a trio and uh with a keyboard player it, essentially that's the band so it's, it's a, not real complicated and uh so we did have a lot of room to breathe we really did you know we could lay it down just like a trio and then kind of put the icing on with backing vocals and uh, keys those guys would work off of what we had already laid down uh, melody wise uh it works well for us. I think we're going to stick to this uh, for the for the next album as well. Well, I, it's a good process. I've known people, um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, one group back in the day, Street Talk, they did their album totally live. I mean, you know, everything in the moment. And it ended up being having a feel to it, but there there were issues of separation and stuff like that 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 uh took a, took away uh I, I think a little bit from the clarity, but that that mix that they had was the sound that they wanted. I record the same way that you guys do. I put down a rhythm track and then just layer things right on top of it. Uh, it works for me. It works for the people I have coming in my studio. Uh, I can send them stuff, you know, so they can have all the time in the world to work on it. And when they come in, they're fresh and ready to go. Uh, we have fun. I mean, you know, the whole idea is, yeah, let me let me give you this. You know, you, you know put you know, some kind of guitar passage to it. Come on in the studio and we'll have ourselves some fun. So uh, I, I totally am in you know, lockstep with you guys. I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I think it's a wonderful way um, uh, you know, to record. And I'm sure that Rob just was you know, hand in glove as far as following what you all wanted to do. You know, yeah. Rob heavily influenced our decisions during, that, during the tracking process. Plus, he made it fun. He know? did. You know? 
he he encouraged us in directions. He's so gentle with our egos. You know, he would hear something that he knew we needed to take in another direction as far as tracking. Right. And he uh, he would encourage us uh, in such a way, like you said, Ron, <laughs> yeah. that he was just fun. And so we learned an awful lot. Let me tell you. Uh, Halfway through the album, we had about a, a bachelor's degree in uh, in recording. You know what I mean? I do. Thanks to Rob. Well, you know, it, it, there's always a learning curve, uh, especially you know you're working with a with a, a new engineer. Uh, I work with new players, and sometimes uh, like the cla- like I work with people that are very classically trained, and you don't even really have a language. They have a language of their own. And, you know, you have to find some kind of common ground, not only so that you can work together, but, you know, to keep the fun factor going, because that's, you know, that's the juice that, that really brings on the energy. And it sounds like Rob really uh, you know, was was the right guy for you at the right time. He was. Absolutely. And we did some searching, uh, visited some other studios, met some engineers. And um, I have to tell you, you know, Rob's studio is remarkable. I encourage everyone to go by there and, and have a chat. Look at this place. But Rob is the one that sold the studio to us. It wasn't necessarily the the gadgets and gear. It was his personality along with the experience that was just unmatched in this area. Well, I've never recorded with Rob, but Rob did me a super big favor. Uh, uh, of course, I I had uh, my first album, the, the Songsmith album. I had it on master tape. But I wanted to transfer it over digitally, and he was the only guy in town at that particular time that had a deck that could play a master uh, recording. You know, it was like one inch tape uh, at uh, mix sound, and uh, put it onto uh, you know a di- digitize it so I could you know keep it and use it anytime I want to, and I could also add on things if I wanted. That was a great service, and he was he was the only guy in town that had that. He w- he was a little bit ahead of his time and. As far as gear was concerned, uh, and I really appreciated him just being there and having that. Yeah, thank he, you. He stays ahead of everybody else, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, he, he, he likes stuff. gadgets, not for the sake of gadgets, because if it can add one feature, he wants to be able to offer that to somebody. Yeah, it's true because he does a lot of label work. He works with the labels in Los Angeles, New York, and and those cats are coming down here uh, expecting the very best. And so Rob makes sure that he has all of that to offer. And that was at our disposal. Let's be honest. All of that is at your disposal. You go in there with a with an idea and a vision. And this is a studio that we very quickly saw we could make that come true in that particular studio. Well, man, that kind of comfort zone is hard to come by. So you guys, uh, you guys, you know, scored big on the first time around. That's for sure. I feel like we did. Yeah, yeah. I feel yeah, like we're yeah. so fortunate. Well, listen, uh, let's get a little personal here with each one of you. Um, uh, Lee, we'll start with you. When did you actually, you know, start the journey, man? I mean, when did you actually get into the music and, and, and you know, became more than a hobby? It was like, you know, a, a life force for you. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll very quickly go. My beginning started when I was 10. I had a band that practiced next door to my home. And they were uh, acoustic. And I used to go over there and hang out. It was my uncle's house. And they practiced in his living room. So I used to go there and hang out. And uh, it was, to me, the most remarkable thing that I had ever witnessed. Sounds coming out of these wooden boxes. And they had vocals that were harmony. And the whole thing was, uh, it was something that, um, that I could feel deep down. I knew that I loved it. I just didn't know quite what to do with it yet. Uh, and then I was presented with a guitar, uh, when I was 12 and, uh, my grandfather taught me my first lick. Uh, I wrote a song that year. So I actually went right into writing. I just felt the melodies in my head. And then I met John to be quite honest with you. My journey took off when I met John. Uh, I went into a basement one night to audition for a band as a singer and I got the job, and uh, I met John on the way out of the audition. He was there the whole time. He just didn't see any need in talking to me until he had uh, discovered if he liked me or not. What kind of band was it? This The band was Endover. Yeah, Endover, and it was, the band was based out of uh, Westfield, Massachusetts. Hard rock. Hard rock. All Hard right. Rock. So we would have been like <laughs> Deep Purple, 
uh, awesome. Alice Cooper, Ozzy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that one, man, I tell you, I couldn't believe I got the gig first of all, but I was in a real band, and that was just blew me away. So from then so on, so you were the lead singer of a hard rock band your first time out, like in ten minutes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, he was the only one that could carry it too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so John, you weren't throwing in a lot of harmony. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I, I destroyed all the tapes. They weren't great harmonies. I tell you what, though, brother, I learned how how to have fun. You know, we've chose really, we chose good music for the times, and we we brought stuff to a stage. You know, this is the high school period, and we chose songs that other bands weren't playing, and that was you know that's always been a problem. Sometimes you go see live bands and they're playing. I mean, if you go to a club, they're playing club music, dance music, and we weren't interested in dancing. Uh, you know, when you do Black Sabbath and, and such, and Alice Cooper, you're not looking for a dance crowd. I mean, you know, uh, it's amazing. Sometimes in the clubs uh, these days, um, uh, the club owners, uh, they say, okay, look, I want you to be a cover band. I'm not, I'm not looking for originals. I don't care about originals. Play the covers. Uh, that's what I want to hear. Um, and, and most of the bands, uh, you know, they're known for... I guess you could say there's slice of covers, but there's always overlap. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know that, uh, and uh, to actually, you know, pick and choose things that are, are distinctive but still have that energy is that's a really smart move. We we well, uh, we played what we wanted to hear. Uh, good call. I think of a good band, you know, that we did a number song, Jay Giles Band. I love Jay Giles Band. Yeah, a lot of yeah. people will say they never even heard of them, but we were in New England at the time, so they were they were like Jesus and. Moses combined up there. Yeah. But, you know, I saw him live. We saw him live every year up there at the time. And you went to a concert of 10,000 people who danced during the show. You were, you were encouraged to dance. And that's what we wanted. You can boogie to this music, even though it's hard rock blues. And, uh, we, that's what I kind of want to emulate. Even Deep Purple, things like that, that were really heavy. Um, you can still move to it. Um, and it was freeform rock, you know, live Deep Purple never sounded like the studio album. That's true. We liked that fact that you could take a three minute song from the studio album and create a six minute uh, jam. You know, you don't you don't have to go 20 minutes like the Grateful Dead, but you can give people a little bit of musicianship. So when did Ron enter the enter the scene? When, when uh, I don't remember. Uh, it was about 1990. Yeah. Yeah. We met yeah. you. Uh, Job site, right? Yes, met him on a job, a construction site, <laughs> yes. and uh, and uh, I, I think that night we drove a dump truck over to his house because he had so many drums, and uh, we put them all in the back and uh, brought them back over. of a of a dump truck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he had a. You want to tell, tell him about it? It was a dually, wasn't it? It was a do- yeah. dually. Yeah, it was a. It was a yeah. We had a I think one it got turn. stolen at one of our. It games. did. Yes, yeah. it did. <laughs> it got stolen again. That's another great story, Ron was uh was just the most fun cat that we had met i couldn't believe that he could also drum but uh, not only did he drum but wow he seemed to really be in our our neck of the woods the kind of music that we like yeah so, we all like the same kind of music all right that that worked out beautiful it's just really really nice that nobody pulled the wrong lever on the on the truck and the drums will go falling out the back i mean you know. <laughs> that's true everything else happened though. Uh, yeah sure. <laughs> So it, it, you guys are together now. You, you're really happy with the music that you're playing. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, putting together that first magic song, the song that really pulled you together on, a, on an original track, what, what song was that? Can you remember that? Uh, you mean then? Well, I mean, it, it, whenever it, ha- it actually happened. Usually that, that's a benchmark moment for most groups when all of a sudden somebody brings a song in and it just clicks. I mean, it's just there. The music is there. you got a great feel for the vocal, uh, you know, very little tweaking going on. And all of a sudden, boom, it's there. And you look at each other and say, damn, you know, this, this really is something really special. Yeah, why don't you take that, John? That would probably be the song Step Long that ended up enduring – this long for us it's in the back of our heads that we can make this song sound as good as I think it does now. Um, we wrote some pretty good music. We wrote some good music and some pretty good music. I feel in the nineties. Um, but a lot of it was tainted by the nineties. So it was very dated. Yeah. Um, true. the sound that we had. And then in the next 20, 30 years, we, our sound, um, matured into a point where it just, 
it, it's not changing. I'm not I'm not going to listen to something and say, well, I want my bass to sound this way now. I'm I'm pretty set. Lee got locked into a sound that has been is so authentic that now I can recognize it when I hear it on the radio uh, before I hear the song if it's something freeform he's playing. So okay, so that that's a really nice segue into the question I want to ask next. I mean, every single one of you has a distinctive style. It blends together because. You guys are just like, you know, you're one, you're one sound when you're together, but you know, you had to come from different places. I mean, all of you weren't listening to the exact same records and, and stuff like that, or practicing the same way. What is it? Uh, let's see, Ron, let's start with you with drums. What is it that, uh, that you were listening to that really, you know, set you on a course that, that gives you the sound and the feel that you have right now? Uh, my dad had to be my biggest influence. Really? He played, uh, big band music. He had a little trio and, uh, man, I grew up watching, you know, uh, I love Lucy with uh, little Ricky and, you know, he was a hell of a drummer. Yeah. That, that's what I wanted when I was a kid. That's me. And I used to sit by my dad and watch him play. And, uh, I got a lot of style from him. You know, I had to do it my way. You know, I, I couldn't exactly follow him, you know. But, but, uh, but let me ask you, did he have his drums set up in the house so you could have access to him on a pretty regular basis? I, I would, yeah, later on, yeah. I definitely had drums, had access to drums. I started out on pots and pans laying in the middle of the floor. <laughs> you know, probably like a lot of kids, you know. Oh, yeah. Did you get that deadened sound that comes from Tupperware? You know what you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I mean, I can remember <laughs> he'd be at a gig and I'd be standing by the, the floor tom, playing on the floor tom, you know. He'd let me play in while they were playing, you know. Yeah. And it was just such a big, big thing, you know. Well, that's really something special, too, man. I mean, what a connection. Yeah, absolutely. And your dad, Ron, did a gigs like at the old Cavalier Hotel, right? Yeah, Cavalier. I can't think of all the clubs, but yeah. Yeah, he's... Yeah. That's for you. Oh, and I, Bobby Day. And, I have to. Uh, I have to include this. His dad came and saw us play all the time in the nineties. Really? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He heavily supported this group. You, you got to love that, man. You got to love that. Well, John, what about you, buddy? What? <laughs> so as far as like you know uh you had to have some bass players that really tripped your trigger uh you know but uh, but you know that get you at least started in that you know creating the groove so to speak well my story is i started uh i started on clarinet which you can imagine i moved to guitar soon after and um by the time i was 14 i was taking guitar lessons with from a gentleman who was in western massachusetts he was the head of the uh the Northampton, Massachusetts Jazz Society. So he was a jazz guitarist extraordinaire. But he, he taught me how to, we were teaching out of a book, and he finally threw the book aside. He said, what song do you want to hear? What do you want to play? And in 1975, 76, there was no teachers doing that. And, you know, you say, I want to play Smoke on the Water. And he's like, oh, that's easy. And I didn't realize he knew all these songs, even though he was so eloquent on the guitar. And that's what we started doing. We started addressing songs I wanted to learn. So I learned chord structures pretty quick from him, uh, how to play rock. And about a year later, I had a bass player from the high school jazz band tell me he really liked my guitar. Would you like to trade guitars? And I ended up with a Sterling bass. And uh, he said, I'll show you how to play the bass. I'll show you how to do some runs. And that was it. I was uh, Everybody wants to play guitar. Everybody wants to be the singer. There wasn't a lot of bass players. It was an easy way to have uh, demand. <laughs> before I walked in here, before I walked in here today, I was listening to a particular Beatles song, and I would probably say top of the heap has always been Paul McCartney for melodies, melodic bass play. I love Roger Glover. Yeah, he just always wins to me. Um, but uh, Roger Glover from uh, Deep Purple, John Entwistle from The Who, the, the people that were doing free form playing, I like that. Uh, when you go in the studio, though, you can't do that. But <laughs> uh, well, you're absolutely right in terms of uh, um, that whole idea of, I guess you could say, bass players are in uh, in short supply. Uh, we went through uh, when I was playing with Cam. We went through like five or six bass players in our in our time together. Uh, for some reason, uh, they just kind of came and went. Uh, we had a couple that were exceptionally special, but. Um, you know, they are, bass players are the hardest people in the world to find. There's no doubt about it. 
Yeah, well, that's why we kept this one. Yeah, that's the only reason. Why we kept it. Yeah, that's the only reason. Most we know what? Yeah. We got tired of looking. <laughs> so many of them have a criminal history, and they're always on the run. So it's a great. This <laughs> comes with the territory. Uh, yeah, it does. Well, Lee, what about you, brother? Uh, actually, I learned classical guitar first. Really? Yeah, man. Uh, and my dad decided that if I was going to do this, I needed to. To learn it right so uh i i took classical lessons from this really cool cat and uh and it didn't take very long for him to w- want me to jam with him and so our lessons went from a normal 30 minute lesson to him shouting at the people at the door to hold up we'll be out in a minute and the <laughs> lesson would last like an hour and a half excellent and, uh, man so we were playing this really really great stuff one of the tunes that I learned initially, and I think this was probably what got me the, the gig with these guys, was I could actually play a song by Stephen Stills called 4 and 20. I love and, 4 and 20. It's a great tune, and none, no, none of our friends knew how to pick yet. But I was uh, classically trained, so I was able to play that song. And uh, so I, I think that I, I still love to pick the guitar. Uh, but from that point on, uh, uh, the, you know, my influences were, well, Stephen Stills was definitely one of my influences, but I was introduced to Joe Perry at about 14 and, uh, Joe Perry's solo style was the coolest thing I had ever heard because it appeared to be right off the hip. It's as if he just walked in, grabbed the nearest guitar and started to solo it. And uh, to me, that was the most um, enjoyable sound because it didn't sound forced. And uh, so I, I, I wanted to be uh, more like him than anybody else, I think. But after that, there was a Johnny Highland. Are you familiar with Johnny Highland? No, I don't think so. So Johnny Highland is a chicken picker. And uh, I learned chicken pick early on from, a, from this cat down at a pawn shop. And uh, he taught me Sweet George Brown how to chicken pick sweet George Brown. And uh, so Johnny Highland is probably the best chicken picker in the land. I learned uh, some stuff from him. Uh, Larry Carlton. Definitely know Larry Carlton. By chicken picking, are, are you talking about something like? Uh, they call it percussive picking. And Jerry Reed did a little bit of it. Uh, like uh, Chet Atkins uh, kind of stuff? Yeah, or? Chet Atkins would have done that. Um, so um, even Les Paul would have been, you know, one of the cats that would have done that. Right. I was, I was going to mention his name too. So um, the chicken picking thing really appealed to me because I could get that percussive, funky sound, kind of like a bass player would, but done on a guitar. And um, so we incorporated that into our songs. As you listen to the tracks, you'll hear the chicken picking ended up being kind of a, a root to a lot of the solos and even the way I play the rhythms. Right. But, uh, and then more recently, Ron Wood. Uh, I, I really started listening to what Ron had contributed to the band The Faces, you know, their music, and later The Rolling Stones. And what a fantastic guitar player. You know, he just had this, once again, a relaxed approach to playing guitar um, that I really did. I think, if anything, I would strive to be as free and relaxed as I can when we're performing the, the music in the studio and live. Well, that... that- that's an excellent segue into the next thing I want to ask you guys. Uh, just how important is, is uh, you know, performing live in your lives today? I mean, you know, it, it's a big part of uh, almost everybody that I know in the music business. Uh, some are, are getting away from it. I've gotten it totally away from it for one reason or another. But uh, musical performance, uh, you know, it's, uh, how important is that as far as publicly performing your stuff? Well, it's, it's ha- you, know, you know, traditionally it, always, it was money in the – it was a way to produce – sales for music i think then in the last 10 15 years things started flipping i always used the eagles as an example and all of a sudden tickets were 150 dollars a night to see a band like the eagles because they realized the value of their them showing up somewhere um in the last two years with covid and everybody buckling down and a lot of people making music we feel there's a way to make music and and make a living off it without Killing yourself. That's, that's all. We all did that. We did that in the 90s. We killed ourselves going to bars and you start at 8.39 and you don't finish till 2 and then you pack up. And, you know, you do it Friday and Saturday night and if somebody calls you for a weeknight gig and you really, uh, 
it's it's hard. <laughs> and you know, yeah. we're we're all getting older, and we're like, can we make can we make this into something where we enjoy it and get it out to people? I think if somebody needs something from us live, we know we can do it. Yeah. We've got besides our own talents, the uh, musicians and particular two particular people we use on the album are there for us, and we can create and recreate everything we do. And. Um, I I understand exactly what you're saying as far as like uh, getting uh, older, a little further down the road. Tanya and I uh, performed for over 25 years. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I just got tired of hauling equipment. I mean, you know, plus back in, back in the old days, um, uh, you could set up on Friday and leave it there and break down on Saturday night. Not anymore. You set up on Friday, you break down on Friday. If you got to work on Saturday, you're screwed. You know, uh, it, it, it just makes for a, a really, really... Uh, stressful to me and also very uh, laborious, you know, situation to where you just work your, your work yourself to death. Right. Yeah. There's so many jokes and memes on the internet about bands, you know, talking about getting, packing your $5,000 worth of gear and your $2,000 car and driving for an hour and you come home with $50 and we all here and talking to you, we all survive and make a living and, and we shouldn't shouldn't sell ourselves short when we play our music, obviously. Oh, I understand, and and that's that's another thing um, that I really feel like a, uh, a kindred spirit with you guys. Uh, you all are more into the what I call the business of music than most of the people that I know. Uh, most of the people that I know, uh, I guess you could say, that are out there playing, their number one thing on the business of music is who in the band are we going to get to actually book us because we don't want to actually do that all we want to do is play booking the band is all they know and as far as as far as licensing as far as marketing as far as all the other things that are involved uh you know with uh, what you all are doing right now uh you all are very much out there in in the vanguard as far as the people in southeast virginia so um just exactly you know without going into great detail uh, how have you all expanded, you know, from the performance angle to use the business of music to get what you want? Uh, so, Tom, the name that comes to mind is uh, sustainable. Sustainability would be the number one goal for this band so that we can continue to make music and bring it to our listeners. In order to do that, we have to have time to write and record and produce the music. Uh, and we found that the best way to do that was to sell the music. You know, it was a, it is a revenue stream that didn't require us to be present. So it made sense to us in the very beginning of the project, we had several meetings and, and it all came down to that. We will, we would use the streaming channels to, uh, to sell the music that way and put it right back into the band. And then uh, as we got, became uh, aware that a vinyl and CD were going to happen, then we decided that was also a great way to generate revenue to put back into the projects that we like to do going forward. Uh, playing out takes up a lot of time. It, it can be really fun. We all agree. It's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun for the listeners uh, we're not convinced that that's the best direction for us while we're still trying to record albums. We have a lot of music piled up that we want to record. <laughs> we have yeah. a lot of music yeah. piled up. And so we're hoping, you know, that we can generate enough revenue through our wonderful listeners that they will be kind enough to pick up some of these these records and CDs and, and choose us on Spotify. And, and that will generate the revenue that's needed to continue this, this, this project. Well, I think you guys are on the right track. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you have the sound to sell, uh, uh, the whole idea of, of putting it out there in so many different ways, not just CD, uh, and download, but also vinyl. Uh, you know, there's, there's so much, well, there's just so much to that and it takes time to develop all those different scenarios. I mean, I know people who actually have been in the business for, longer than I have, which is long. And uh, they have used gigantic catalogs and they haven't copyrighted a single song, yet they go out there and perform. I mean, what, what in the world is that all about? I mean, there, there's a certain, you know, something that you have to educate yourself with, with as far as the business of music to actually see 
that you guys can actually do what you want to do by having that knowledge. And I think that, you know, over the time that you that you learned all of that, you really have put it into good to good use. Well, well, thanks. I appreciate that, Tom. We, uh, some of the areas we grew up in or lived in, you know, we ended up meeting, Lee and I, uh, he, he came out of North Carolina, I came out of New York, we ended up meeting in high school in Massachusetts. And that area, we used to call it a wasteland. Like, like there was nothing there, but there really was, it's actually a tremendous, a tremendous amount of well-known people have come out of there musically that we're friends with. And these people had, uh, were very successful in the business of music and all genres. I, I, we have friends from there that are in I have thrash metal, heavy metal. Um, we have people in classic. We have Americana with, uh, for instance, like the, the band Stained with Aaron Lewis. Mm-hmm. We have connections. The, the sound person, the guy that does all the sound for Aaron Lewis, was our rhythm guitarist in high school. Do we use those as connections? No. We look at them, though, as... They're making, they've made a business, a life out of it. Mm-hmm. And we kind of, we didn't focus on it enough, and now we are. That area is very musical, Tom. Well, I mean, it's a beautiful, you know, confluence of everything. You all have found your style. Uh, you you love playing together. You have that seasoned sound with you. You, you have learned over time the bu- business of music. And now you ha- you have a product, and it's ready to launch on all these different platforms. So the, the the possibility for success, the percentage of go up, you know, almost exponentially, you know, as far as uh, the possibilities of having your music not only heard, but also bought or streamed. It's a good thing. I should mention that, you know, having done all of the marketing ourselves at first, it was evident that this was a task too daunting for musicians trying to write and produce an album. I mean, seriously, you know, our our job as as band members are to work on our music. That's what we're here to do. And that's what we really love the most. So uh, I reached out to a company in Austin, Texas. The company is called Show Folk. And uh, Show Folk agreed after uh, deliberating for a while to take on the project of marketing this band. They didn't take it lightly. I was actually wondering if they were going to take it. They, uh, they took the project, and uh, we took our hands completely off of it. So we've just been focused on producing a good, solid album that we're, we're happy to deliver to listeners and allow them to do their job. I'm going to tell you that we won't use uh, anyone else in the, near, uh, the, in the foreseeable future but more importantly, we won't be doing it ourselves anymore. <laughs> After seeing what they were capable of doing and how effective it has been, and I can't stress it enough. I would tell any of our listeners that are bandmates, uh, consider hiring uh, a company to do your media for you uh, and, uh, and then get back to the, the business of making music. Well, I understand, man. Um uh, on, on this side, on, uh, the way I do it, I, I mean, I write the songs, I play in the songs, but I also record the songs and master the songs. Uh, you know, it's, it's fun every single step of the way, but it's also incredibly time consuming. And, uh, you know, after the, after the project is done, that whole business of marketing is, is a huge gigantic thing as well. So, uh, yeah, I might take a tip from you guys and, and learn a few things and, uh, do some research on that and maybe, uh, take a little bit of the load off myself. Well, when you look at any product, whether you, if you own a factory that makes sneakers, you know, you're producing content that has to be sold. And as a musician, you, Tom, you know, you're sitting down and writing a song. To, that's the hardest part is writing a decent song. and You know, you make a great song. So you say, wow, that was hard. But now to go ahead and make social media content and merchandising content, it's like the same thing. It's the same ladder to climb and the one thing that we all don't have enough of and we'll never be able to buy enough of is time so why not devote your time to the things that bring you the most joy the most fun but also uh you know if somebody else can take what you do and and kick the can further down the road you know more power to them Uh, you know i I keep telling everyone that asks me about this project that it, it takes a village and it really does you know a village of really talented people uh show folk 
obviously has done their part to to bring us to the public, but also, wow, you know, the musicians, our engineer, Rob, uh, good Lord, man. Um, the record stores. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're so fortunate that we'll be in these record stores and these, these are musical people out there that are eager to help. You just reach out to these people. That's what we did. And they were all thrilled to be a part of your, of our project. I'm sure there'll be a, they would love to be a part of anyone's project. You know, we're all one big family. We truly are. And this village makes music for people to listen to forever. Well, guys, uh, we've pretty much reached the, uh, the limit of what the, the SIVA cast length has, you know, usually is. Um, I really would uh, like to, for you guys as best you can to, to tell everybody. I mean, I know the album's going to be released on the 18th. I mean, full blown release with everything out there. Uh, but where, you know, where can they actually find more about you uh, outside of uh, Facebook and websites and stuff like that? Is there other pl- are there other places they can actually find more about your music? So we're on every streaming site. Uh, first of all, so any any type of uh, streaming platform that, that the listeners are out there on will be there for them. They just have to just to look us up. Faithful Kate and um our website is actually a, a very strong resource for us. The website has every type of link, contact, resource that you could that you could ask for. So we've relied heavily on that. Is that faithfulkate.com? It is. Okay. And then the, the you know coming up as far as where do you get it? Where's 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 the product available? And we will be showing off the record stores that We've reached out. We this was a lot of groundwork. We probably name them. Yeah, we we pretty much know everybody now. for the area. Right? Yeah, for the oh area. yeah, like we'll turn it up. And Birdland Birdland Records, Records is huge. Yeah. Um, hope to we'll be in uh, shortly here in Skinnies in Norfolk. Right in Massachusetts, Turn It Up Records has three locations. They've already agreed we'll bring in product up there this month. Yeah. Um, out of New York, we've got. Geez, I've got the record plant up in Rochester. What's the name of Waterloo? Oh, uh, Waterloo Records in Austin, Texas. We're just, you got to find the record stores where people are passionate and they still exist. They want to sell records. Well, they also, if, if they're going to carry our records, they talk to Lee, they talk to me. They want to know about us. And then lo and behold, they talk to the customer and they sell right. the product uh, because they believe in it. Also, they can purchase the uh, CDs and the vinyl on our website. So the store, the store will go online. Uh, the night of the 17th in order to have the album available when it goes live on the 18th. Well, listen, uh, this has been great. Uh, I, I've talked to Lee before, but John and Ron, it's, it's really been nice talking to you guys too. I can tell you uh, from my heart, I wish you all the absolute best success. I know how hard you worked. I, I, even though as fun as it is, it's still work, it's still time, and you're dedicated to to the proposition of your music. And it, it really does show. So, um Looking forward to hearing the entire album, and um, uh, I really have enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, it was we a have, pleasure finally talking with you, too. Certainly, Dan. Thank you for playing our music for this uh, this entire time that we've been in the studio. You've been pumping us on on, the, on your station. And, uh, you know, I named you the, the Border Blaster from day one. And I <laughs> yes, you that. have. Uh, <laughs> You know, you've done us all a great service. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure. And I look forward to, uh, to eventually sitting down with you guys face to face and, uh, you know, at least having a conversation over a beer or something or doing some jamming or whatever. I look forward to those times. Sounds yeah, awesome. That sounds yeah. great. Awesome. Sounds great to us. <laughs> well, you guys have a good evening, and I will see you and talk to you soon. All right. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Faithful Kate. Faithful Kate. Check out Radio Siva by going to the Siva Sound homepage and clicking Radio Siva or to live365.com and search Radio Siva. If you have any questions, comments, or topic ideas for SivaCast or for Tom and Alton, go to sivasound.com and click on the contact tab.